You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. Come on, Lenny. Pump it in there, baby. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. But they are who we thought they were. The other day I'm in the car with my kids and uh, I uh, was on my way to the coffee shop after I would drop them off at school to write this sermon and so I thought, you know, I've got a captive audience. Let me ask them about the value that we're going to be talking about this morning. And so I, I asked them, I said, is there a time when you have felt lonely? Tell me about that. And so my uh, eight-year-old daughter Addison, she said, yeah, there are times where I'm on the playground and uh, my best friends that I usually play with don't play with me and I, I feel lonely at those times. And then I asked my 10-year-old and Maddox, and he said, yeah, I remember uh, when I uh, do new things, I feel lonely sometimes. When I uh, went to camp last year for a week-long camp, I, early on I felt pretty lonely uh, when I was there. And then my daughter, Addis, uh, Brooklyn, I asked her, my five-year-old, she said, I don't know. Uh, and and so uh, I, I, I came back around to him. I said, well, is there something that you do that makes it helpful? That, what do you do when you feel lonely? And so my daughter, Addison, she said, well, uh, I, I usually try to find other friends that I can play with, and usually that works out one way or another. And then my 10-year-old Maddox, he said, uh, well, I, the second, I went on a retreat recently, and so the second time I did the thing I did the first time, I didn't feel near as lonely. And my daughter Brooklyn interrupted and said, can we talk about something else? <laughs> and uh, I'm sure uh, that there's a licensed therapist that could help figure out what those responses were all about. But here's what I learned from those words. One thing is, loneliness is something we all experience. And loneliness is something that's pretty painful in our lives. For Addison, even the thought of that brought a tear to the corner of her eye. And I'm thinking, great, this is the way to drop her off at school this morning, right? And my daughter Brooklyn's, uh, can we move on comment, I think was its own way of not wanting to deal with sadness, uh, And many of us know how to divert those feelings in our own way. We're experiencing a loneliness epidemic in our country right now. In 2017, the general surgeon of the United States, Vivek Murthy, said that loneliness and social isolation is one of the greatest epidemic problems of health in our country. You you can talk a long time about tobacco, uh, cigarettes, you can talk about heart disease, you can talk about obesity epidemics, we can go on and on, but the Surgeon General in 2017 said this is the growing epidemic we need to be aware of, loneliness and social isolation. We believe as a church that this is something we need to pay attention to, we need to respond to, because we believe the church is the answer to this very problem that was true back then, but it's increasingly true in our own day, and it's true across the generations. So today I want to share with you about this value of combating isolation. And some of the things that isolate us and make us feel that way, but also how we are to respond as God's body as the church this morning. And so I know I'm speaking directly to uh, some of you this morning that are feeling this in a real, uh, real close way this morning. And you're thinking of maybe your children or grandchildren that are experiencing this in other ways. Uh, I want to pray as we open God's word this morning. Father, we come before you today as a people who understand loneliness, and we're grateful that you uh, understand this as well, that Jesus has experienced every temptation, every struggle that we have faced. We're grateful that you understand, and you understand what it's like to to be in heaven as you watch the loneliness of your son on the cross. And God, yet in the the midst of our culture, we we are feeling the effects of this in so many different ways, in our own lives, in the lives of those we love in our community, and we see this as an opportunity, God, an opportunity to respond in the ways that you call us to respond. And so I pray you would give us an imagination this morning through your word, through scripture, and in our own lives, in practical, tangible ways that we can leave uh, to be different as we leave today, so that we can experience community and offer it to others who need it so desperately. I pray this morning you would pour through me the gift of preaching so that Christ would transform our hearts and our lives we might be formed in his image. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, and all God's people who agree said, amen. Our vision here at Greenville Oaks is 
to transform Collin County by mentoring thousands to trade the pursuit of artificial success for the abundant life in Jesus. And that artificial success can come in a lot of forms, and that artificial success can isolate us in many ways. And this morning I want to talk about two specific situations where Jesus encounters people who are experiencing isolation and how he brings them and uh, offers community to them. So if you have your Bibles this morning, feel free to open to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 19. I want to tell the story of Zacchaeus this morning. Zacchaeus. Uh, This is the first example I want to share about Jesus' interaction with someone in the Gospels. Luke chapter 19 verse 1 begins to tell this story of Jesus' interaction with this fellow. It says there, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Now, as a kid, I learned a song about Zacchaeus that many of you probably have taught or heard yourselves. It went like this. You can sing along with me. That would help since I've got the microphone on. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. All right, that's good. We'll stop there. I know you can finish the song. Now, I, I, I think about that song, and I think, man, what an interesting detail. Like, what kind of songs are we teaching our kids? That's all I remember about Zacchaeus, really, was he was a wee little man. And yet the first details here in Luke 19 are a little different. It says here that he was wealthy, right? I mean, there are other ways. We can define Zacchaeus, but he was also short, the text tells us. He was a chief tax collector. And we assume the wealthy with great jobs have friends and never feel alone or isolated. They've got enough to go around. But I guess we're wrong because wealth doesn't protect Zacchaeus from loneliness. In fact, wealth is often a trait that goes along with uh, isolation. Because when we're wealthy, we often don't need the people around us. We don't need the interaction. Our wealth protects us. It provides more property to protect us from the interaction of those around us that actually can provide community. Zacchaeus had achieved success, at least an artificial kind of success, but it also had isolated him in this large crowd. So he climbs up in a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus, and Jesus spots him. Jesus, the text says here at the beginning of chapter 19, is just passing through Jericho. But he finds Jesus. He spots uh, Zacchaeus in his isolation. He moves toward Zacchaeus in his isolation. Jesus sees something about Zacchaeus that knows that this man is alone. He needs community. He he doesn't actually invite him to anywhere Jesus lives because Jesus is the stranger here. He says, I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. And in that interaction, Zacchaeus feels the guilt of what he's been doing, stealing uh, more than he should, perhaps, from those that he was taxing for the Romans. And so he eats with Jesus, and he ends up actually giving back uh, money more than he even owed to pay back those that he had engaged in sinful theft with. Part of how we engage back in community sometimes is to find the wrong that we've done and to pay it back, to apologize, to find some kind of justice that comes back and reconciliation can happen. And Jesus helps them through that. So artificial success, wealth can be a thing that isolates us and something we should pay attention to in our own lives. The second person I want to point us to is a guy named Nicodemus. You find this story in John chapter 3, which I'm not going to read this story there in John 3 to you, but feel free to open there to the gospel of John. We'll go to a different place in that gospel in a minute with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a member of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. This is a kind of political group, but it's a religious group that helps uh, adjudicate things and determine the way forward for the Jewish people. He was highly respected. He was in a position of power. But the problem of being in a position of power is it's sometimes hard to speak up and question the party line of that tribe because they might turn against you. So sometimes there's an isolation when you found yourself into a leadership position, a feeling of Uh, feeling hemmed in in some way. And there's something about Jesus that caused Nicodemus to wonder if he was the the one that the Jewish people had been waiting for. Maybe this was the Messiah. So Nicodemus goes to Jesus, and the detail here in John 3 says he goes to him at night, which I think is an important detail. 
Because questioning the prevailing beliefs of your tribe is isolating. And the rest of the Jewish ruling council had known Nicodemus was, if they'd known that he was considering that Jesus might be the Messiah, there would be repercussions to those kind of questions. So he felt isolated in the midst of believing in who Jesus was. Some of us this morning may feel that sense of, man, if I go all in on Jesus, there might be some isolation from family that taught me another way. Or maybe it's an isolation of leaving a behavior or a lifestyle that you realize that there may be loss of friends if I truly admit what God's leading me to. And it's an important lesson for those of us who are leaders or parents or friends. If we find ourselves in positions of influence in a community. If people are questioning Christianity within a, a church like ours or maybe in your own family, let's allow people to ask their questions and doubts without the fear that if they ask their real questions, they might be ostracized and isolated from that community. Because Nicodemus finds a place to go whether they want him to or not. How do we become the kind of people that people bring their deepest questions to us, knowing they'll be safe and received, they'll be loved first in the midst of it? So let us learn to be a safe place where people can bring their real questions and doubts without fear of exclusion. That's what Nicodemus needed, and it's what Jesus offers in this moment. See, Nicodemus had experienced an artificial form of religion, success within that artificial religion. He was in a community that rejected his deepest questions, but Jesus loved Nicodemus first, just like we talked about last week. Jesus allowed Nicodemus to feel fully known and fully loved in this moment. And in John chapter 19, later on in the story, Nicodemus shows up again. So you read with a little bit of what happens to Nicodemus after this interaction with Jesus. He tells him, you have to be born again. And, and Nicodemus is confused by all this. But Nicodemus seems to stick with this community, seems to stick with Jesus and his teaching. And later on, we find a remarkable thing when Jesus dies on the cross. Listen to this small detail in the story. This is John chapter 19, verse 38 and following. Again, this is right after Jesus has died on the cross. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the, spice, with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now these probably seem like small details if you're not paying close attention. Why does it matter who exactly took the body and where they placed this body? The big news, though, is that Jesus has died. That's the story we walk away with from this chapter in Luke 19. But John could have reported this without any of these details. In fact, the other Gospels don't seem to mention these details. But we find out about this guy named Joseph of Arimathea, who's a follower of Jesus, a disciple of his. But did you pay attention to that detail when they introduced him? He secretly followed Jesus. Why? For the same fear Nicodemus had, out of fear of the Jewish leaders. I find this really interesting, and this is a theme throughout the Gospel of Luke, actually. Because this is written to a group of people who are experiencing the same persecution later on in the 60s, 70s, 80s in Jerusalem and around there. Many of them are being kicked out of the synagogues because they're believing that Jesus is Lord. And so these stories are reminders, they're hopeful reminders to know there are others that have been isolated, that have feared the Jewish leaders and so forth. But this Jesus movement, this early church, we welcome those questions. The same fear that caused Nicodemus to go to Jesus at night in John 3 is the same fear that caused Joseph of Arimathea to secretly follow Jesus. But this shared fear between them has turned into a relationship of some kind. He's found that there's this one in the Jewish ruling council, Nicodemus, who's safe to bring his questions to. And so Nicodemus is providing a relationship for Joseph of Arimathea that in the same way Jesus had provided to him in John chapter 3. Look, if we want to be a church that helps people out of isolation and into community, what it's going to mean is whatever fears they experience out there, they need to know this is a safe place in here to walk into community and to find Jesus in the midst of it.
Jesus helps Zacchaeus move from this artificial success of all the wealth that he had accumulated. And he helps him find community in the midst of his repentance. And Jesus helps uh, Nicodemus move from the, uh, the, the, the artificial religion that he experienced in the authentic relationship with Jesus. So I'm wondering in your life, who is it that you're helping move from isolation to some kind of community? I think all of us need to think about somebody right now in our lives that we see that's isolated, they're alone, they have questions, and they wonder, where can I go with these? And that love first value we talked about last week provides an opportunity for us to take people from the isolation they feel into the community that we have to offer here as a church and you have to offer as a follower of Jesus. Now, if you were to ask me a a story that sums up who God the Father is, in fact, just last week I was asked this question by someone after second service. They were asking me a particular question. I told you, I, I told them, I, I, think, I think the story I would talk about if I were to clearly explain who God is is found most clearly in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. Turn with me there if you would. In, in that chapter, Jesus tells three stories. But he tells these stories in a particular context that we often forget in telling these stories. He tells these stories in response to a judgmental remark that some religious people mutter while Jesus is combating isolation, of all things. He's eating with tax collectors, he's eating with sinners, and these religious leaders kind of mutter on the way by. Why is he doing that? Why is he eating with these people anyway? This man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. And by the way, let me use this as a reminder to say, if we choose to be a a love church, first church that combats isolation... There's going to be religious people who might mutter the same things about us. We'll hear the same accusations. We don't think it's a good idea to eat with those kind of people. Some things never change. But Jesus isn't going to let their muttering go unchallenged. And so he tells three stories. The last of those stories is one we often refer to as the parable of the prodigal son. I, I think we need to find a new name for this story because there's two sons in this story And they both are in similar situations, although very different situations. I would suggest to you that both of these sons in this story, they're isolated. They feel lonely. They feel disconnected. But their isolation appears very different. Let's start with the younger son, for instance. So imagine this father has got two sons. The younger son comes to the father. And he despises his father so much that he asks for the inheritance that he's going to be owed once the father dies before the father dies. Father's still living. This is such an affront in that culture. But the younger son says, I want your money. I want your inheritance. And he leaves with the money. So he takes his money and goes off and he squanders his money in wild living. And after he had spent his entire inheritance, he ends up working for a pig farmer, which, if you know anything about Jewish food regulations, is a no-no, right? Pigs run clean. But this shows the depth of how far he's walked away from his faith, from his father. Some, some of you know this journey quite well. This is a hitting bottom kind of moment for the younger son. He realizes he comes to his senses in this moment. In fact, he longs to eat the pods the pigs are eating in this scene. That's how bad it's gotten. And some of you know what that's like because you've hit bottom as well. Or maybe you're on your way down and you're wondering, where is the bottom? It just seems, seems to get lower and lower. And in that moment, he comes to his senses and he thinks, Maybe my father that I stole everything from, my inheritance, maybe he'll receive me back as one of his servants. That was the best he could imagine in this picture. So he starts that long walk back home. When he gets to the property line, in view of the father, the father comes and he embraces his son. He runs to him and he welcomes him back home and he tells the people, look, I want you to come around. We're going to have a party because my son was dead and now he's alive. The younger son is isolated. He has no one to turn to except the one that he's sinned against. He needs community. He needs friends who will stick with him through the challenges of rebuilding his life. And yet he feels like he's out of options. His only lifeline was the thought that maybe dad would receive him back in a lesser status. How many people in our world are right where that younger son is right now? God desperate, he sees them and he's longing for a body of people, somebody that would reach out and would love them in the midst of the depth they're in and would welcome them back home, that would receive them with a hug in the same way, that would kill the fattened calf and throw a party to celebrate their return. And that's what the father does, the father runs. This is what the church is supposed to do. 
Is we're supposed to model the same kind of looking out for the lost and for the strays and those who hit bottom and say, come home, this is the place to heal. This is a place where you can be received. That's the reputation we should be aiming to develop. When people don't know where to go because they've hit bottom, they say, those are the people, those Jesus people, they can help us out. But as I said, there's another son in this story. The older son. And while everything looks good on the outside with this son, he's responsible. He's stayed home. He's done everything right. But he's as isolated as the younger son is in this story. Some of you can relate better to the older son. You've been faithful. You've done the right thing. You've worked and worked responsibly to have the life that you have for yourself, not needing anyone else. In fact, sometimes our righteousness can become its own kind of prison, can't it? But I'm here to tell you, self-built success can be just as isolating as throwing your life away. Because you can do everything right and still feel isolated and alone. In the story Jesus tells, the younger son comes back home. We've already talked about the father embraces him. And the, the older son hears the party. He hears the music and he hears the dancing. And I want you to listen to what happens at this point. This is Luke 15, verse 26. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. The party's going on. The community's gathered to welcome the younger son home. And where's the older son? Refusing to go in the party, alone, outside, in his own self-righteousness. The older son is experiencing the isolation of envy and self-righteousness. He's as lonely as his brother ever was. But the father doesn't stay in the party with the younger son in that moment. He notices the older son who's isolated as well. And he goes outside the party, and I want you to listen to the rest of the story. This is the second half of verse 28, Luke 15. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And is found. This is why this isn't just a story about a prodigal son. This is a story of two sons, both who experience isolation. And both of these sons experience the love of a father who sees them in their isolation and pursues them and calls them back into community. Social social isolation is the epidemic of our time. It's one of the largest issues that we are facing right now. And it has all kinds of consequences and all kinds of things that we could talk about with all kinds of stats this morning. I have some of those for you. Rates of loneliness have doubled since the 1980s. One third of the population, one third, says they have two or fewer people to lean on. A 2010 study found that weak social connections can shorten a person's life by 15 years which is the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Think about that. Across the generations, we're experiencing an epidemic of loneliness in our time and our place. Older generations have struggled with social isolation for for years now because of the death of friends and loved ones, transitions to new places, new cities and facilities, and the physical challenges of a lack of mobility. But for the first time in 2017, Young people climb to the top of the list when it comes to social isolation. One in three young people say they feel completely alone much of the time. Nearly 40% say they have no one to talk to or feel left out sometimes or always. And sadly, studies are showing us that religious participation isn't making much of a difference between those who are connected to church and those who aren't. And it's not just senior adults and teenagers. My kids experience loneliness. 
your kids and your grandkids, and you experience, I experience loneliness. And for some reason, we feel ashamed to admit we're lonely because it looks like everyone's connected. But can we just admit that we're lonely this morning? In the midst of the busyness, in the midst of the social media profiles and what we project, we're lonely. And Jesus wants to do something about that. Jesus wants to combat the isolation that you feel. Part of the abundance he wants you to experience is close relationships with people who will help you move from isolation to community. You know who wants you isolated? The evil one wants you isolated. The thief that Jesus talks about in John 10 wants you isolated. Because the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The evil one comes to fill you with discouragement and desperation. The evil one thrives when you feel alone. But Jesus comes to offer an abundant life. And the early church followed the example of Jesus. They created a community that experienced life together. They met daily in each other's homes, breaking bread early on, right after Pentecost. They felt this sense that they had a community even when they left the families that kicked them out, the synagogues that had done the same. The early church was the community that accepted and redeemed Saul in the moment he needed it most. You remember this story? Saul approves of the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And later on in Acts chapter 9, he's, he's on his way to persecute other Christians because he's convinced that this Jesus, see, the, 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 church, the, 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 the synagogue, the Jewish leaders are still doing this in the next, right? They're kicking people out of the synagogue. They're causing fear. They're persecuting and killing. And, and Saul's one of those who's doing that. He's one of the chief ones who's doing that. But he meets Jesus on this road. Now imagine the isolation that Saul must feel if he's convinced that the one who appears to him on the road is actually Jesus. Because now he's got this decision, am I going to go back and refuse to believe what I just experienced, this bright light? Or am I going to believe that Jesus is actually Lord? And there are implications to both. Because if he doesn't accept Jesus as Lord, if he goes on in his way, then he's ignoring the experience he's had of what God's done in his life. But if he believes it, he's leaving an entire community of people and he's going to depend on the very people he's been persecuting and killing to receive him in. And what does the early church do? Ananias receives him in. The religious terrorist who's been killing some of the loved ones that, that they know, Ananias receives him in, the church receives him in, and he's transformed. The early church was the community that welcomed Peter back into the fold, Right? Peter, who denied him three days, it's less than two months later that he's standing preaching at Pentecost. And they receive a message from this one who had denied Jesus that God's doing a new thing in this day and this age. They welcomed and received him back home after his isolation. The early church was the one that cared for the orphans in that day. When it was common to expose children and allow them to just be exposed to the elements and die. It was the Christian community in the early centuries that welcomed them in, that took those orphans in, made them their own children, provided for these kids that were isolated. The early church was the community that cared for the disease in the midst of epidemics much more than what we're seeing even with coronavirus right now. It was the early church that received them in, which makes me wonder, what does that look like for us in our own day to be this church that takes those who are isolated, who are alone, who are diseased, who are orphaned, all of those who are left alone? It's the church's job to welcome them in. And you know what happens when the church does that? They grow daily. God adds to their numbers. Because there's never a shortage of people who are isolated who need community. The early church grew because they chose to invite isolated people into an experience of community. And the same can be true today in the midst of our epidemic of isolation. And I shared some stats earlier with you that are discouraging about the health risks, about all of those things about isolation. But there are other stats that should offer us hope this morning. There's opportunity in the midst of this isolation. In one study I saw this week, the two highest predictors of longevity— how long you'll live, our close relationships and social integration, how much you interact with people on a regular basis as you move through your day. Adults who have at least three stable relationships have lower rates of dementia. Women who have three stable relationships are four times more likely to survive breast cancer than those who experience isolation. Men who've had a stroke, who meet regularly with other men, are better protected by that kind of social contact than even the medication doctors can provide. 
yet over a quarter of the population says they have no one to talk to. This is an opportunity for the church. When it comes to young people, the thing that makes the largest difference in their lives is having a trusted relationship with adults that they can trust. One-third of young people, listen to this stat, one-third of young people have one or fewer adults in their life they can trust, and that includes their own parents. If you have no trusted adults as a, as a, as a youth, 66% of young people say they feel alone. Now, if you change that number from zero adults to one adult, that number goes from 66% who feel alone to 46 who feel that way, 46%. But listen to this. If you have five trusted adults in your life as a young person, only 9% say they feel alone and isolated. And this is why one of the things we've said in student ministry and children's ministry is we want every child outside of their parents to have five trusted adults that in those hard teenage years and young adult years they can look to. That's why our youth group and the small groups that are there on Sunday nights are so vital for your teen, for your students to be involved in classes that go on. All of these things that we do to volunteer in these areas are vital for the kind of community we need to build. The church has an opportunity and Greenville Oaks is committed to being a church that combats isolation. But it is going to take all of us to make this a reality. This isn't something we just talk about and make a reality. And we're not there yet. Many of us right now feel like we're in the midst of isolation. But I don't think your question should be, how are the elders and the staff going to make me feel connected? I think the question we ought to consider is this. How am I going to pursue the relationship in the midst of the isolation that I feel and that others around me feel? Recently, I had lunch with a, a member of our church. This guy was feeling a bit isolated, he and his wife. And he and his wife realized that many of the people that he had been friends with at Greenville Oaks over the years, over a, a decade or so, had moved away for one reason or another. And I love what his response was in the midst of that. Instead of just mourning over what was lost and feeling alone, they assumed that there were others who were experiencing and feeling the very same things they were. So when it came time for this vision series that we're doing and the vision groups that we encouraged people to start and be a part of, they said, we want to we start one of those. And they reached out to six other uh, people in their stage of life, family units, and they said, well, do, you, do, you have, do you feel isolated and want to connect? And all but one of those said yes, and the other had found a group that they had already connected with. I love that response because it, it can be easy to feel like no one else is feeling what we're feeling. But if we ask and we're vulnerable about the isolation we feel, what we find is there are plenty of people around us who desire community they don't have either. At the end of this series, I want every one of us to have a next step that we're going to move toward. Something in our lives that we're going to move forward to as we think about the mentoring that we're being called to do, the abundant life that we're stepping into, the combating isolation, the love first, the celebrating transformation, all of these values. And I'm going to make that clear by the end what some of those steps can be for you. But this, for some of you, may be the very one you need most. That you know you feel isolated, you know you feel alone, and church doesn't help because you show up on Sunday morning and it feels like no one speaks to you. It feels like it can feel more isolating to be in a crowd and not be spoken to or not have the connections you see others have. And what I want to let you know is you are not alone in that feeling. And there's a long way we can go as a church to making that better. But it's going to happen not by some kind of program or top-down thing. It's going to happen because you see others and you vulnerably ask, hey, would you ever want to get together for lunch? Would you ever want to share a breakfast? Would you ever want to get together and see if there's a group of people that would want to form a group here? And not only that, it's not just about this church, right? Think about the community that's around us and how many people long and need community around them in different stages of life. I think just to our next door neighbors here at Christian Care Center, the opportunities that are there that many of you step through on a regular basis to provide community to those who feel isolated. Think about your mom groups. Think about the gym that you're a part of. Think about the schools that your kids are at where all these young people are experiencing a loss and isolation. You know, I love, one of the things I do that I love is uh, going to my kids' school and serving as a watchdog, which is dads of great students, right? And so we get, we get to go. I, at my school, I can basically sign up for one day because there's so many dads that are involved. But there are other schools in our community not too far away that it isn't hard to sign up for dozens of those days because there aren't as many opportunities for the dads that are part of those schools to be able to serve. What would it look like for those of you who 
who have time on your hands to say, hey, Colin, I want to know more about that, this watchdog program. You don't even actually, actually have to be a dad of a student. You can go through the, the volunteer process and security process, and they can team you up with a school to help walk with young people that need to feel connected. I don't know what it is for you, but this may be your next step. And I want to challenge you as we step toward what it is that's going to be our next step as a people. What, what might community look like for you? If you feel isolated, I want you to know it feels like you're the only one probably. You are not alone. And God calls the body of Christ to be the place where that community can happen. So I want you to, I want you to be a part of the solution with us. I got to tell you, a lot of you will say to me often, Colin, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry to ask some of your time. I, I know you probably don't have time for a lunch. And I, I want to like stop everyone who says that to say, no, that's exactly what I'm here for. It's exactly what I want to connect with people for. And I think that's true of so many people here. It looks like we're living such busy lives, but in the midst of the busyness, we miss the connection that's most important to let people know that they're not alone and that we're not either. So I want to close with prayer this morning. And I want you thinking this week about this. What's the isolation that I'm experiencing in my life? And who can help me with that? But not only that, who's around me that I see that needs a friend, that needs someone to come alongside them? How are you going to be a part of the solution to their isolation as well? Let's close this morning with prayer. <clears throat> Father, it's easier to talk to things that are really not a struggle for many of us in the room. It's easier to talk about problems that other people have. But when you begin to approach topics that are so real and so obvious to so many of us, that it were hard for us to admit to others, well, then the church has got to do something about it or we're made out to see that these aren't values for us. God, this was the beauty of the early church, is in their isolation, disconnected from their heritage of faith before them, in their disconnection from their families, in their disconnection from the jobs they had to leave in order to become Christians. They found a community, a family, brothers and sisters that walked through life in deep ways with them. God, many of us this morning could raise our hands and say, God, we want that same community. And some of us have to admit, we don't, we don't want it as bad as we say we do because our schedules are so busy we couldn't find time. But many of us, God, we're lonely and we have plenty of time on our hands and we just need somebody to reach out. We need to have the courage to reach out. And so, God, I pray this morning in the midst of the loneliness and the social isolation that we feel in this church that you would be closer than uh, a brother or sister to us, closer than our own breath, a reminder that you are with us, you are our shepherd, that we are never alone. But, God, we need more than just a heavenly father. We need brothers and sisters on this earth who can be a part of our spiritual family that can guide us from isolation to community. So God, would you help us to be that church? Would you help us to be that people? Would you help us to be individuals that look for that in others? And may this be the very way that we grow as a church is to see the pockets of isolation in our city and in our county. And we would move to be the people who respond to that. I pray this morning you would uh, inspire us to do a next step, God, in relation to this. Either to reach out with the isolation that we feel to others or to see the isolation we see in others and invite them in. Maybe even by the time we leave today, would we make a step? to do that, God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who never leaves us alone. We thank you for your church that's intended to be uh, the answer to isolation in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.